everyone, and welcome to another Things We Said Today, where we talk about the Beatles' past, present, and to come. Uh, I'm your host, Steve Marinucci. I'm a contributor to Billboard and Access.com, and I want to welcome you, and let me introduce who's with us today. They're in uh, almost, well, the East Coast has, has got some weather problems, and but we are fortunate to have with us uh, in Pennsylvania... Uh, the uh, executive, executive, everybody say yes, yes, executive editor of Beetle Fan Magazine and longtime contributor or co-host of Fest for Beetle Fans, I guess I can say that, uh, Mr. Al. No, not, not a co-host. Not a co-host? I've, I've been involved with it for, you know, since the beginning. Okay, okay. Mr. Al Sussman. Hello, Al. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Hello, to everybody. Oh, I tried. And also uh, in Connecticut, um, that's also with us today, I'm the host of the Beatles show, Every Little Thing, and Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? I'm fine. And missing from our group today is Mr. Alan Cosen, who is uh, covering a classical show on the night we're taping this because it actually got moved up a day because of the snow. Where This is, this is Monday the 13th, and there are snow warnings, uh, snow alerts out for the East Coast as I'm, as I'm speaking here. So we're very lucky to have this even together tonight. Uh, we almost did not do it, uh, but thank you guys for, for making it. And joining us, joining us from uh, the Big Apple is uh, th- that... Well, somewhat short, somewhat south of the Big Apple. South of the Big Apple? Oh. Yeah, south. Yeah. Do West. Do West of the Big Apple. West. Who has a long, long list of credentials he gave me just before, and it probably could have been even longer if we'd have, if we'd have waited another five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> the Beetle Branch writer and contributor, Beetle fan, writer and contributor, and co MC of the Fest for Beetle Fans, the one, the only, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tom Franchione. Give him a big hand. Yay! 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 Well, it was a pleasure to uh, to sit in on a session with you guys, and of course Alan uh, in absentia. But always always fun to be on the things we said today show. Thank you, thank you. And we are going to talk about uh, since we have three people here who were involved with the vest. We are going to talk about that. The first, we're going to talk quickly about some news items. Um, the first one we'll talk about is the actually happened today, where Paul McCartney announced he's releasing a cassette of the three demos uh, uh, with Elvis Costello from Flowers in the Dirt. And that, was, uh, that is, um, the three songs are I Don't Want to Confess, Shallow Grave, and Mistress and Maid. And guys, let me uh, start with Al. Al, what do you think of this? Well, actually, this at least partially solves a little bit of the, the controversy that's been swirling around uh, Mm -hmm. the Flowers in the Dirt uh, uh, archive collection because of the fact that uh, the you know the whole thing with uh, you know one basically one disc's worth of the material being available only through a download. Well, now you have three three tracks from there that will be available in a a physical form of some kind. Let's put but it not, but not but not on CD, but on cassette. not on CD, but on a physical form of some kind. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know. Um, it, you know, some people probably will pish posh that, but <laughs> well, I mean, te- technically speaking, it's a lower fidelity format than the digital that will be available to the. Well, of course, we don't left. know. We when was the last time you listened to a cassette? Well, well, I mean, do you even have the ability to do it? Right. <laughs> right. Well, I do. Yeah. I, 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 I do too. Yeah. I yeah. Do some people. To. Some people, yeah, uh, there there were people commenting on Facebook today that yes, they do have cassette players, and so some people still do. But and they, you know, for all we know, they may make this on, uh, you know, a much higher quality, uh, you know, tape than they used to. But that isn't going to change the fact that these are very these are rough demos. They're not. They're oh not, yeah. They're not studio quality. They're not what I would call studio quality tracks at all. Well, some people find that appealing. Yeah, well, exactly. true. I mean, some to people find that they are rough. So. Right, and that, I mean that's. But I mean, what you're doing is you're taking a rough quality track and you're making it even rougher. 
to a certain extent. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, like I said, I, I mean, I've heard the three tracks and they sound, they sound like they came off of cassettes, you know. Well, they, let me, they're not, well, they're not let me used, ask, go ahead. Let, let me ask Tom, does this at all, you know, because you did a presentation on Flowers in the Dirt at the, uh, at the fest and, uh, you know, we know that, you know, that you're definitely opposed to the download only uh format of that last batch of uh discs does this at all at least partially assuage your uh i don't think so i i think it gives the the collectors something to get i imagine you'll see later in the day on record store day loads of people selling them for obviously inflated prices mm -hmm. um yes some of us old war horses still have i mean i know i i have a cassette deck which i use only for transferring old cassettes onto CDs. <laughs> right. um, what else would you do with it? You, you're certainly not going to find a car with a cassette player. And it's um, and, and it was going to be. I mean, nobody. There was no price release today, so we don't know. I, I, I don't imagine it will be a lot of money. I mean, I would. I wouldn't think so either. The, the appeal here is 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 going to be, I think, only as a collectible, as opposed to you know a, an audio piece for the archive. Because think. Who's going to go buy that? I'm thinking anyone who's going to do that, and I don't know if you guys have ever done the record store day thing, getting up in the morning, waiting in line, you know, all mm, kinds of, yeah. buying all kinds of Stooges records, or whatever else is right. coming out that day. <laughs> but people who who would collect that, who are McCartney fans, my guess they're going to buy the, the Flowers in the Dirt box set, and we'll do the download. I mean, certainly I'm going to do the download and put mm -hmm. them back onto a CD so that it's portable and permanent and archived and all that good right. stuff. If I if I come across one of those cassettes, I don't imagine it's something I'd play. It'd be like having just like a little a novelty piece. Right. Uh, okay. You know, but yeah, I, I wouldn't I, play it on the cassette. You know, no, I, I don't, I don't think very many, I, I think anyone who said, put it this way, anybody out there who says, wow, those are three songs I got to hear, if they are that level fan, you can bet they're buying the, you know, the, the box that has you know, the other nine or ten demos as well. Right. I don't think anyone's mm -hmm. going to seek this out to say, okay, here it is. The you know, Here's the Holy Grail, the Rosetta Stone. This is what I've been looking for. Uh -huh. I don't need the other nine. Anyone who wants this, I think, is going to be already have purchased the box set. Mm, okay. I would think, I would, think there are going to be people that will they'll look for it for that, you know, and not buy the box set. But, yeah, I think basically you're right, though. I think most people will. But, yeah. and, and like, it, I mean, the tracks are, two of the tracks are not on the album. I mean, that's the interesting part about mm -hmm. it, um, you know, so. In yeah. fact, one of them, I even said, I don't want to confess, I never even heard about that song. Right, now, mm -hmm. that's you know, not yeah. available in, in any form anywhere. And right, right. The Shallow Grave was never on, a, certainly not on a McCartney record, it was on an Elvis record. Right, and right. And Mistress and Maid, there is actually a really clean Mistress and Maid demo out there, mm -hmm. but it's only Elvis. Um, and it yeah. was a, got on one of on one of his Ryko discs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and and the the three demos, both of them singing on it. So yeah, well, that the cat, yeah, obviously the draw here on Mistress and Maid is that it's both of them. Right. Um, right. I've heard it, that that one in particular has a couple of uh, distortion, you know, drenched pieces to it. It does. Um, yeah, it, it it's you know it is what it is. I'll tell you the I think of the other two. I don't want to confess. Uh, people seem to agree at the at the presentation I did at the fest. That seems like it was only about halfway there. It sounded like a lot of placeholders in the lyrics and and even in the mm -hmm. arrangement. But shallow grave isn't terribly far off of what Elvis uh, ultimately put on the record. I, I mean, he obviously put a, a kind of a cool funky rhythm underneath it, but from a, a structure point of view, it's that's pretty much what it is, and it's kind of neat to have. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me that they started they started out a little bluesy. See, there was a, yeah. a little bit of a blues tinge on each of them for me. I mean, that's what I I have to admit. I haven't heard the Elvis, you know, the Elvis versions, but um, mm. so. In any well, the more he gives, the more excited I get. So these are three three things we weren't expecting. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, so, my, my uh, guess is that he'll probably, if, knowing his track record, there'll be a fourth cut just buried at the end somewhere. <laughs> then, then we'll all have to go get it. But this uh, whole conversation, you can just scratch it. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. right. There'll be an Easter, an Easter egg of some kind. Yeah. Let's, let's also talk about the McCart- about the, uh, the tour announcement going back to Budokan, which really is not much of a big deal because he was there two years ago. But, you know, I mean, the, the idea of him going back to Budokan where the Beatles played is, you know, has a little bit of symbolism to it. Um, uh, long as long as he doesn't try to smuggle any pot. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But anyway, uh, the, I mean, the question really beyond that is, is, you know, where's he going after Japan? There's been no word, you know, outside of Japan so far. That's all we've gotten. So that's kind of unusual. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. considering a lot of time has passed since those first three dates were announced, right? Mm-hmm. That we haven't heard anything since then. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, yeah. maybe maybe he is cutting back then. Well, th- there's also the album that you know he's supposedly working that he's working on that. That's that's people true. are speculating. Yeah. There, the, I mean, I've heard you know nothing from him, but you know the people are thinking that it might come out this year. I mean, that probably has something to do with that, but maybe not. Mm-hmm. You know, who knows? So, yeah. Okay, next. Uh, let's, I'm going to leave the uh, the movie thing to last. Let's talk about Ringo's uh, Access TV special that, that just got announced the other day. Um, it's uh, the 26th uh, at 10 p.m. on uh, Access TV, which if you have direct TV, you have it. Um, a lot of people say they don't have it, and I don't know uh, who carries it outside of um, DirecTV. Uh, I would assume there are other cable companies. You might check with your cable company. But in any mm-hmm. event, um, any comments about about that show? Well, I'm thrilled to see any all-star band uh, concert on television, period, because mm-hmm. that rarely ever happens. Right. And I really think that, especially for certain outlets like PBS, I don't know why some of the Ringo All-Star DVDs haven't been on a channel like that. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, they're it's just true. the perfect the perfect avenue for, you know, every mm. time they have a pledge drive. Pledge drive, yeah. You know, I would love to see, you know, one of those shows televised because a lot of people still have never seen Ringo and the All-Stars. And mm-hmm. in any of the lineups, you're, you get a good taste of what it's all about. And this was, uh, we should point out, this was from last year at Follinger Theater in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Right. On June the 21st, with uh, his most recent lineup of the last four or five years. Right. So, um, you know, I, I'd like more and more people to actually get to see people who have never been to an all-star concert, what it's all about. So the more exposure, the better. Yeah, it's a, it's an hour long, or the it's 58 minutes long, the actual footage, which means the a lot of the songs are cut. But it does have a lot of Ringo. Which may make a lot of people happy if there's a lot of a lot a lot of Ringo and not so much everything everything else. So. Yeah, well, you'll probably be able to get one each from everybody, and you know whatever that leaves four, five from Ringo. Yeah, it, I'm not even sure. I know I've gotten a couple things off AXS. They have commercials on that channel. Yes, right? they, yes, they do. Okay, so is the the 58 minutes is the net playing time so the thing's going to yes. be on yes and it's okay. the net playing time yeah well, that, first, that does first, not include the commercials okay so a ringo show from this outfit has been running two hours right on the nose so it'll be half a show and since everybody pretty much does two or three and ringo does you know maybe eight or nine uh yeah it's probably right maybe one a piece from everybody and four or five from ringo and that'll get us out mm-hmm and I think actually that will probably have a lot of people happy that there's more Ringo. Than yeah, I, I don't think it makes sense to do to do all the Ringo songs, right? I mean, or, or no. you know, not do I don't know a you know a, a Toto song or something. Uh, I think the whole angle is having the all star band, and they do you know you show what the show is about. It's a hit show, right? Um, mm. So I I like the idea. Um, and this band, I mean, it's essentially the same one as we saw. Um, you know, on the, the DVD that came out from the Ryman, um, you know, with the exception of Mark Rivera um, not being there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and then the set list has changed only slightly. So uh, maybe a couple of the Ringo songs will be the ones that have been swapped out, you know, like Honey Don't and You're 16 or whatever. Mm-hmm. 
it, it, yeah, and so yeah, that'll be that'll be pretty good. Anyway, okay. maybe there'll be a DVD from this too. Yeah, I was thinking that maybe that that would be the case. Uh, right, that uh, might have that might have the complete show since they mm-hmm. since they since they bothered to edit, yeah. edit it down. They might just do that. Uh, I'm I'm wondering if that makes sense with the same band, you know, to have another DVD of essentially the same set. Mm. You know, I mean, there is. I mean, and I, I think the Ryman one is. You know, I mean, let's face it. There's a tour, uh, a tour CD or DVD from virtually every every tour, mm-hmm. um, every lineup. I think the Ryman one is is the best of the lot. I thought it was a great show. Plus, you had like one little All Star Plus moment when Joe Walsh came out. So it, right. mm-hmm. it kind of had that nice little kick to it too. Right, right. Not only that, but the camera work on that concert was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, that's a great DVD. The the, yeah. Rigo, the Ryman is is a great DVD. The wonderful, yeah. wonderful show. I was at that show. I don't know if I right. Oh, I didn't know yep. that. I didn't know. That's so true. I, I, I celebrated my fiftieth birthday in a hundred and four yeah. degree heat in Nashville. Right. <laughs> well, congrats, congratulations, congratulations. Yeah, so that was that was a great show to see. All right. The other, one, yeah. the other thing to talk about is the Liverpool Police film um, that uh, came out um, a couple weeks ago to possibly have. Or I should say, it was it, it. Mike McCartney said that um, it, it may very well show uh, himself and Paul McCartney and possibly John Lennon and George Harrison lying on the roof watching police maneuvers um, in Liverpool. And and you guys saw the film, and I and I saw the film, and it's you know I mean the only thing about it's hard to. Uh, you know, even if you look there, it's it's hard to determine if it's them or not. The fact that it might be them, I think, is is you know kind of fun. But you know, I mean, we've had better better looking early films of them than this. Uh, that one where they were actually in the in the club was was much better than this. Um, but uh, mm-hmm. what do you guys? What, what did you, it, what, we were talking about this before we started taping? What do you guys think? Basically, nothing to say. Okay. This is the most non-newsworthy story. Yeah, really. <laughs> because how desperate do you have to be for some kind of Beatle news to say that this footage, which took place a block away from where the McCartneys lived on Fourth One Road, could be, yeah. could be, Paul and John and Mike McCartney and possibly George, when even if you look at where they're telling you it is on the film, which I think is like 43 minutes in, if you look right there, you can't see... It might even be a speck, if anything. I, I mean, there's no way. I disagree. What? I disagree, Ken, because the, because number one, it's in many years from now. Number two, Mike McCartney. They got confirmation from Mike McCartney, and and I think when you have both of those things together, I mean, without without either without both of those, obviously you have you don't have anything. I mean, you have you have the possibility. But when you have McCartney saying he believed it was them, and and then and then the the quote from many years from now that I used in my story and that got printed up elsewhere, uh, you know I think you have to you have to give it a little bit of of give, give Peter Hudson who discovered it a little bit of credit there. I I, I do. You, I'm not except, saying it's not them, but Mike didn't say it definitely was. He said it. Could yeah, be. and it's you been. Not okay. must be. It may be. He doesn't mean yeah. must be. He means maybe. I'm looking at the quote right. It might be. It could be. It is. <laughs> it said that definitely could be us. I'm looking at, at his quote. Um, but I, I mean, well, I, I mean, I, I am not going to go as far as to say that, you know, I think John Lennon and George Harrison were there, but I think it's very, very likely that he, it was he and Paul, and, you know. Because of that, because of those two, those two issues, I think when you have Mike McCartney saying, you know, very likely that it was them, and you have have Paul independently saying in many years to now what he did, I think right. you have to. I think you have to give it a little bit, a little bit of credit there. So uh, I think that, you have. Doesn't to, mean it's them. It doesn't yeah, mean it's and, them. Yeah. No one's denying that they spend time on the roof at some point. You know, but that doesn't mean in this film that it's them. The shed on the shed on the back of the film is their house. That's their house. That's Twenty Fourth Lynn Road. 
Yeah. So, I, I mean, can, I, can you prove that it's them? By can looking I at prove it? it's them? Because I wasn't. Yeah. No. Can I anyone couldn't. prove it? I, I, I mean, I that picture, that frame that I used in the billboard shot. With the circle, I, I mean, I looked at it, and you know, you, you see what you see, you know. I mean, that's that's the deal, um, you know. No, I can't prove it's them, but I think you have to you have to say, you know, wow, you know, it very likely might be them. I think, you know, I think you have to. It's not. I don't call. I know some a couple of people. I think actually said fake news, and I don't think that's true. It's not fake news, at least not the just way. it's it just it's no news. It's just there's okay. nothing. All right, all right. You know, <laughs> I'm I'm there's looking. I'm uh, I mean uh, I know, not speaking for Alan, but Alan said you could have a satellite photo with somebody in it that might have been McCartney too, and that's true. I mean, there's you have to look at it from both from that side too. That you know who knows, but the fact that it might be them was kind of kind of. Interesting. Okay. All right. Now we can get past that. Mm-hmm. Now we can get on to the Fest for Beetle fans. And you guys were all there. Al, you, you went through the – you were all over the place, correct? I was all over the place, but actually Tom and Ken and, – and Ken was only there one day, but mm-hmm. even, even so – um, he and Tom saw a lot more of what was going on in the ballroom than I did. I think all, the only things I saw in the ballroom were the two, the Saturday and Sunday night concerts, and Chuck Gunderson's um, Sunday morning, you know, early, you know, early bird special. Tom, who did the who did the early bird special in in uh, in the absence of Jude Kessler? Jim Birkenstadt. That was yeah. Right, and um, uh, because uh, not sure how many of you know about this, but uh, uh, Jude Kessler, uh, her, her father passed away. Right, just before, uh, just before the fest. Just, not, just before the so fest. She did not. And, she did not. And so, as much as she loves being there, she, you know, obviously was not able to come. All right, let's go. Let's go through it day by day. Let's start with okay. fri- Friday night. Tom, let me let's start with you on fr- what happened on Friday night. Well, the always entertaining trivia contest and yes. the soon games were very well attended. Actually, yeah. I think you know um, Friday was an was a good crowd. Um, yeah, lighter, obviously lighter than Saturday is going to be, mm-hmm. but better than Fridays of recent past. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, and the hotel um, really really made a difference. Uh, its location, I mean, literally steps away from the path train from Manhattan. Uh, very very easy to get to. That that obviously helped uh, you know get some people in the door, but uh, the fact that it was you know centrally located, you know very easy to get to, I think helped the attendance. And you know, let's not take anything away from Mark uh, Lapidos who put together quite a show and quite a guest list. But uh, so you know the the stage was set uh, you know both literally and figuratively for a good show. Friday night. Um, you know, uh, again, I can speak to the, you know, the attendance at the events I hosted was very, very good mm-hmm. uh, for the trivia and the, the name that tune. But I think one of the, the really, you know, I mean, Friday is usually for those of you who've been there, you know, it's the main stage is really um, groups, uh, you know, meet the authors, meet the guests, meet the photographers, etc. Mm-hmm. And then a, a, a dance party, just uh, not the not all the guests coming up and playing with the band, but just. Some good rock and roll and people dancing and dressed in 60s garb, and it's it's a lot of fun. I get to host that, too. That's a, a good deal of fun for, you know, to kind of launch the show. But kind of the, the, the hit for me on Friday night was the um, the late, you know, the late, late, late show mm-hmm. uh, of David Bedford, uh, a good friend of all of ours from Liverpool. He's written a couple of wonderful books on the early Beatles and, and Liverpool, premiering a rough cut of a film that he's... Uh, the associate producer of called Looking for Lennon, and it had a lot of really good news footage and and home movies. And uh, David, through his numerous contacts in Liverpool, um, got out to the rest of the Stanley family. The other, you know, we always read about you know the five strong women, but we only mm-hmm. ever hear about Julia and and Mimi, of course. I was sitting there watching this with uh, another good friend of ours, Bruce Spicer, and I. I tapped him on the shoulder a couple of times saying, have, 
is it me? I mean, am I getting that older? Have I never seen these pictures before? Mm. You know, John at you know at school, John at you know at the beach with his friends, John in the backyard. A lot of good family stuff, like family album stuff, and it's set against the backdrop of uh, you know nineteen forties Liverpool. Very very um, informative and entertaining. Uh, it's still in rough form. It, it had a lot of uh, I guess it's called the thread running at the bottom. You know, with the running times and stuff until the footage is officially incorporated into um, right. you know, in, into the production. But um, what was interesting, and uh, as was addressed in the the post screening Q and A with David, was there was original Beatle music in it and original solo Lennon music. I believe Working Class Hero was in there. And someone said, "Gee, did you have any difficulty with Apple?" you know, licensing the music or anything. And he said, well, not at all, because we didn't go to Apple. We went to, you know, we went to, uh, you know, to where Universal or Sony, whoever, whoever takes care of those things. So they went, they would have gone to Sony, I would think, Sony ATV. Yeah. And he, hmm. he said uh, they've not hit any, you know, any red lights. And um, it's kind of weird. You know, I mean, I remember here we were talking, you know, you guys talking a minute ago is, is something newsworthy. I remember when they licensed half a minute of you know of, uh, of a revolver track for Mad Men. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It was um, a they paid a king's ransom for it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. That was news in every sense. Yes. It was, was it was there was a big right. big you know push on that. So I'm not sure if maybe you know I have no reason to think David isn't uh, being forthcoming or anything, but I'm just not sure all those details have worked out. We could leave it at that, but still. Mm. Um, my guess is he'll be coming to Chicago in the summer. And for those of you going to the fest, make sure you have an extra cup of coffee so you can stay up for the uh, the Friday night movie <laughs> after the concert. That was really a treat. That was for me Friday night. Uh, that was the highlight. Okay. You were just reminding me, Tom, of when Good Old Frida came out. Mm. Yes. They, they actually used Beatles recordings in there, and that was news. Believe me, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. you remember though, Frida when we asked her about that, she said, you know, that she went in the door. And, you know, she went with uh, the producer, uh, whose name escapes me right now. But um, oh, they uh, went, Ryan, Ryan White. Mm-hmm. Ryan White, thank you, Al. Uh, they went into Apple and, and took care of the licensing. And, you know, let's face it, Apple, there's still four, you know, four important voices there. And uh, the sense I got from Frida was that they said, you know, she hasn't ever sold them out or done anything like that, and it was it was their way of just kind of giving an, a nice nod to her and, and supporting her in this film. Uh-huh. Uh, David, you know, <laughs> his connection to the band might be a little a little more tenuous than the yeah. was, <laughs> but um, you know, maybe that maybe that kind of stuff is freeing up a little bit, or you know, becoming more accessible for, for licensing. Interesting. So, that would be nice. That would be nice. That, that would be very nice. Well, yeah. it depends on, depends on how how loose it gets. I mean, we don't want to have Revolution Nike commercials anymore. Yeah. Well, no, so. for, for a project like this, which is about one of them, uh, I mean, it makes mm-hmm. perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it did add to it. Like, It opened up to the strains of working class hero, as I recall. Al, did you take the movie in or had you uh, already no. been at the uh, bar? No, yeah, uh, <laughs> I had already hit the bar. As a matter of okay, fact, well, um, well, in Chicago, make sure you have a cup of coffee. Yeah, uh, and go see this thing. The you know when it opened with that, and I you know it's the guitar chords. Obviously, I'm going well. It sounds like the real thing, but I mean, I, I know I can play that song. Probably a million people can play that song, but certainly when the voice kicked in, that was uh, it was the one and only. So. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay, and, yes. and and not and not Mark Hudson. I said one and only. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay, Al, you, Al, you didn't see this film, correct? No, no. Okay. Unfo- uh, I, for whatever reason, I uh, must have forgotten that it was on the schedule, or I was uh, exhausted, or whatever. Well, it, it was the anti early bird special. I mean, yes. after the dance contest, that's it. You know, that, that's yeah. usually the Friday night wrap. You know, yeah. the, the dance concert. This was kind of like a, a value add at the end. was was really good. Okay. Yeah. All right. I enjoyed it. All right. Let's move on to Saturday, which, of course, is the big day. The big uh, day. The big mm. day. And, okay. Uh, uh, Tom, let's start with you again. Okay. Um, well, I'll, our primary master of ceremonies, Ken Dashow from Q104 in New York, he didn't – he wasn't able to get uh, – the main ballroom till about one thirty or so. 
So I was kind of anchoring that stage. And as we, we mentioned, Jude Kessler, you know, was a last minute uh, swap out. So basically I introduced Jim Birkenstadt to talk about his book on the, uh, the Beatle Who Vanished, which uh, I'm sure many people know is being made into a movie. Yes. Um, yep. So who's there to share that, some details on that exciting project? Then so it's, it's definitely a movie because I also saw a TV well, series or something. Film project. Uh, film, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the way he, because I talked to him and the way, uh, the the deal is that the Orson, or, um, Orbison brothers have the rights to do what they want to do with it. And um, mm. so it, they're looking to dramatize it is basically the way it sits. So. Yeah. Okay. Then um, Bruce Spicer came on and did his latest um, uh, multimedia special uh, about Sergeant Pepper. The, the weekend had kind of a had two prevailing themes as far as I was concerned. Maybe Al, you can comment on this, but mm-hmm. certainly Sergeant Pepper's anniversary was everywhere you turned. Oh, absolutely. Even That's on the even the topic. you know the, the the I guess the the logo. For yeah. this for this particular fest was a uh, was a Sergeant Pepper cover with a lot of the guests and staff people and various yeah. and sundry other people connected with the fest. Yeah, and you know there were there were you know all kinds of nice pictures, posters, things like that, mm-hmm. um, and just kind of a good you know kind of a good buzz you know about what will they do. This is kind of like we saw in 2014. We know Apple is not real big on on tying things to anniversaries but even they couldn't pass on 2014. No, no um, way. The 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 strong uh word on the street as it were is that mm. I don't know when this yes. show's going to air but uh the last week of March we should be hearing some some more details a little yeah. further than the speculation that's been running in a lot of the the British papers about the reconfigured album and things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But Pepper was one over, overriding theme of the weekend. The other was, in a word, wings. Yeah. Uh, there were mm-hmm. three wings on the on the card, which was Steve Holly and Lawrence Juber and Denny Sywell, all of whom have been guests before, but each of whom mm-hmm. had something new to add this year. Steve Holly uh, has a new band that did a set of Beatles songs, which was great, and he also uh, drums with a group called the the Birds of Paradox. Um, with a couple guys from Elephant's Memory. That was also a Saturday afternoon concert where they re- they recreated the one-to-one concert for the 40th right. anniversary mm-hmm. of that. Tell me, tell me how, I, I have not heard Birds of Paradox. Tell me how what you think of them, Tom. I think they're very, very good. Uh, Jeff Slate is the, the front man, uh, New York mm-hmm. City session guy, uh, who's been around quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Very tuned in. Jeff also writes for Beatle Fan now and again. Right. You- see him uh, do a feature piece here and there uh-huh. but he's got uh, adam and gary from the elephant's memory so i mean just that for one-to-one obviously adds a, a nice air of authenticity and steve drums with them so that was kind of nice and then lawrence juber uh, again a, a longtime friend of the fest he had a, a new album out his third installment of his acoustic beetle arrangements uh-huh. danny sywell sat on a, a very interesting drummer's panel Yes. In the afternoon. Yeah. With in Steve the... Holly and uh, mm-hmm. Chris from the house band. And Billy, I want to get his name right, Amendola. Am- Am- Amendola. Mm. Yeah, um, from from Modern Drummer Magazine, talking mm-hmm. about, you know, Ringo and and some drum technicalities and, uh, and things like that. It was really, really quite interesting. Let me quickly, before we get too farther along, we, we did not mention Bruce Spicer's Sgt. Pepper book. You guys, I'm sure, know about this. Did he, yeah. mention, did he talk about yeah. this at the fest? Okay, um, he's yeah. doing a. He's uh, just qu- quickly. I'll just say he's doing a, a book of Sergeant Pepper memories, and he wants them from fans, um, and you can contribute to his book at Beetle dot net. And there is not much time. I think there's only like about maybe t- maybe a week and a half. Yeah, about contribute. that, yeah. yeah he basically so, wants to have most of the most of the contributions in probably by about the middle of next week. Right. Uh, you're, you, know, uh, you have an article in there, Al. Uh, Bill, Bill, Bill King, King and does. I uh, each have uh, each have a piece uh, uh, a piece from the archives. Right. Uh, from Beetle Fan Pierce that'll Hemi, be in there. Pierce Hemmings and Pierce, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there are many, and there are others that that are in there too, and. Uh, Matter of fact, I'm gonna, I've got to get my act together and send him something too. But um, yeah, so uh, go to Beetle.net 
if you want to send him a contribution for the book. Anyway. Okay. Okay. Uh, Al, Al, uh, were you going to say anything about Saturday? Well, no. As I uh, actually, probably Ken should would probably have some comments about, uh, especially all that was going on on Saturday afternoon. Ken. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, I was in in two main places: the the Act Naturally room, right, where I was part of three different panel discussions, and then I was also in the main ballroom. And I just want to say uh, very quickly about the main ballroom. You were talking before about Klaus Foreman. The interview that Ken Dashow did with him was excellent. And as far as I'm concerned, it was worth it just for just to see Klaus for that yeah. one hour on stage. It was very revealing. He talked about when he first heard the Beatles in Hamburg. And he, he actually said that he loved them so much as a live act. He prefers them as a live act, too, in the studio. Mm-hmm. And it's like a, such a different experience to see them live compared to what they did in the studio. And he was basically not not a rock fan at all. Mm-hmm. He was a jazz lover. He really loved mm-hmm. jazz. So it wasn't until he saw them in the club. And, and I also heard that, that he saw Rory and the Hurricanes, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. Right. Might have been before sure. the Beatles. Mm-hmm. He probably but, did. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, the whole experience of seeing them live is what made him the major fan that he was. And they, they always kept close, even when they weren't, if uh, you know, if they were in England, John in particular would write to him a lot, and he talked about the Revolver album cover and that the Beatles gave him complete freedom to do whatever he wanted to do, which in a way is um, it's a benefit because you have this freedom, but it's also kind of tough to know where to start. Yeah, <laughs> did without he, even can, being given a clue. You know, did he? Did he? Now, this is uh, this is curious to me because Chris Carter sent me an interview with Klaus. And Klaus said that Joe Walsh does not have the original cover. Did he say anything about that at the fest at all? I don't remember him talking about the Joe Walsh cover. Because Joe Walsh, because a couple of years ago when they had that big, when they had that get together in Los Angeles that he was supposed to attend that he missed because he was ill, and that Ringo attended, that Carter hosted. You know, they all thought they were all saying that that was the and Walsh thought he had the original cover. And in this interview, Klaus says it's not the original cover. And, and that's the first I've heard that it's not the original cover. So the question is, who has the original cover if if it's not Joe Walsh? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And yeah. I, I should probably I probably uh, get a hold of Chris and ask him if he uh, if he followed that up. But Sounds like a job for the rock and roll detective. There we yes, go. Well, or, or or the rock and roll reporter, one of the two. Yeah. But mm-hmm. but anyway, um, so the thing with Klaus though is that there's so yeah. much history that he's got with the Beatles, okay. and there's no way you can get everything in there in one hour on stage. Right. And uh, when you talk about all the solo stuff, he really only talked about working with John, and in particular that he loved working on the Plastic Ono Band album, mm. and he even said a quote from Ringo that Ringo told Klaus that. The greatest power trio he was ever in was when he was with John Klaus on that album. Mm-hmm. Which talk, is, you know, did you talk yeah. about Live Peace in Toronto? I don't remember him talking about that. I was kind of hoping he'd bring up All Things Must Pass or the concert for Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. You know, um, no real talk about the other solo stuff. Just mainly John. I would have mm-hmm. loved to have heard him talk about Live Peace in Toronto, if only because of the fact that you know John was out there re- basically for the first time. And the reaction to Yoko. Oh, he did. He did bring up, yeah, the plane ride, which is where they rehearsed. Mm-hmm. But they didn't really do faithful rehearsals. They weren't very complete. Right. Um, and it was really just they were just doing it for the first time there on that stage. Right. So uh, yeah, he um, did bring that up. You know, Ken. It's, uh, it's, here we are for our little trivia interlude of the things we said today. Uh oh. What, what, what do Klaus Vorman and Bob Dylan have in common? They're the only two people who could make this claim. They both played with Frank Sinatra? <laughs> <laughs> Try again. They're the only two people who can make this claim. Are the honeymooners tied into this? Naturally. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't really know. They're the only two people whose faces appear on a Beatles album cover who also played at the concert for Bangladesh, barring the Beatles, of course. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's true. That's, that's, 
that's got to be used for something really valuable to win. I know. Well, well, I'm going to talk about the trivia thing in a little bit, but uh, yeah. going back to Saturday activities, you know, with the wings theme going on, yes. it wasn't just the three wings, but right. the fourth wing kind of flew in, and that was mm-hmm. Denny Lane. Aha. Uh-huh. He, he flew in for Saturday and Sunday, and was, was he was, joined was the that, band? Was, that a, uh, was he expected or not? No, nope. he, was, he, he was an unannounced value add. Oh, my uh, gosh. <laughs> they set him up with a table, um, you know, and he, he jammed with the band and stuff. And so yeah. now, now you got four wings in the house, mm-hmm. and th- there was just a wings vibe to the whole thing. I mean, I, I, I get the, the honor of doing the sound alike tryouts on Saturday afternoon. We had eight contestants. Four of them did wing songs, okay? Yeah. And the one who, who won the contest on the main stage that night was a guy who did an absolutely stunning piano version of Treater Gently Lonely Old People. Yes. Oh, I heard that. Yeah. 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 It's fantastic. And yeah. that carried over into Sunday, uh, you know, just you know, taking that and, and, you know, putting it on steroids is the battle of the bands. We had eight bands, three of them. I'm look, just looking at my program. Listen to the names of these bands. Rock Show, Ram Army, JB, I'm Amazed. Um, mm-hmm. More wing stuff. I, there was a band there. They were the runners up. They did Cafe on the Left Bank. Oh, I mean, wow. Yeah. Not a song you hear on the radio every day. I would like uh, to have heard that one. And then on course, my show, you will. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, of course, in the, you know, in the nighttime jams, both Saturday and Sunday, you know, having Denny and Lawrence and Steve on the stage, um, you know, both Denny's, actually, um, mm-hmm. you know, we got treated to Rockestra. And actually, Al, you were there for this. One of the yes. very nicest things I ever heard from any Beatle Fest stage, they did a version w- of My Love, mm-hmm. but yeah. nobody to tackle the vocal, and Lawrence did the melody line and replaced the vocal mm-hmm. with lead guitar, and it was just stunning. Yeah. Um, the guy is, and he's a world-class guitarist, no matter how you slice it, and he had such technique in there that it just, you know, he wasn't just following the melody line note for note, but really embellishing it it was just a beautiful beautiful arrangement of, of my love um so you can imagine it was, and they did jet on stage and you know a, a bunch more wings songs really a good wings vibe if you're a wings fan this was the place to be last weekend mm-hmm. can i can i ask did yeah. when denny showed up how did you guys know that he was there i mean did he just walked in the door and what did he just walk on stage or what what happened well no actually they had him set up um just outside the ballroom was a gallery for the guests uh, to sign, you know, their their, um, you know, their whatever new CDs mm-hmm. or, you know, and it was for the not so much just for the authors; those were pretty much situated outside the um, marketplace. Right. But for the, call them the special guests. So Joey Molland was out there signing. Uh, Lawrence Juber was out there signing, and they had an extra table. And sure enough, that's where uh, Denny set up camp. I mean, no, what, yeah. what, what I mean is, did, did he, did he, uh, did all of a sudden he walk in the ballroom and, and people well, go? Well, actually, I found out a little bit earlier than Tom did because I actually uh, arrived at the hotel mm-hmm. on on Thursday, and and so when I saw Mark Lapidus, he he said, "Guess who's going to be here this weekend?" and uh, and told me that uh, that Denny had basically called him up and said, "You know, can I?" Can I come on down? Yeah. Wow. Really? And there was another, uh, another, call him a walk-in uh, guest. He didn't go up and play with the band or anything, but he was uh, roaming the halls and taking pictures and signing autographs. Who was it? Our good friend, Billy J. Kramer. Yes. Oh, my. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So uh, yeah. it was, uh, it was a, a good time, a real good time. Uh, I, saw the, um, I saw the concert Saturday. With yeah. the Three Wings guys, and it was phenomenal. Right. And I saw that that tribute. It was a tribute to Henry McCullough that they yes. did "My Love," and oh. that was stunning. They also they wanted to do songs that represented the different eras of Wings that they were in. So um, they did "Getting Closer," which was nice. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. no huge surprises there. But it was also very cool to actually see Denny Sywell and Steve Howley drumming together on right. the same stage. Yeah, that had never been done before. Mm. So. Um, well, you know, Ken, Ken, you would think then that they would have played A Love for You. I mean, unless there's another <laughs> one. I don't know of any other officially released McCartney track where Denny Lane, Denny Sywell, and Lawrence Juber are all credited. I mean, unless you know another one. Mm. 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 Got 
to think about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Keep but, thinking, uh, fella. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, when, you, when, you, when and, you think about who's left of Wings, you know, there's only, uh, outside of Joe English, who's probably never going right. to emerge. No. Not get him. Uh, no. In any way, and, or and, Jeff Britton. Yeah, you know, that's this it. This is it. Right. That's it. There's nobody, right. there's nobody else. Let's, and on Sunday, to have all four of them on the same stage, that was just magical. Yeah, yeah. let's go let's go on to Sunday then. Uh so they well, were one they, well one thing before that, uh okay. before we go to Sunday, uh mm-hmm. one other little kind of as as Tom would say, value added mm-hmm. uh to the, the Saturday night concert uh was and it's a non a non Beatle edition, but uh but Gene Cornish. Mm-hmm. The, oh wow uh, the Rattles. Uh, also, uh, also came by. He's been uh, he's been involved uh, with uh, Birds of Paradox and with other various uh, bands that play in the uh, in the New York area. And uh, Tom, if I remember correctly, I think he may have come by in Chicago as well. Not sure about that. Uh, I'm not speaking to Gene Corner, so I really yes. don't get involved. <laughs> mm. He and I are just are not. Uh, you're, you're just friends. No, no, we're we're, we're we we not, not even. <laughs> we ain't friends. Could I just say a couple things that because we kind of breezed by um, Jeff yeah. Slate, Jeff Slate, the yeah. performance uh, of the 45th anniversary for One to One was was amazing. It was one of the highlights for me. They did almost every single song that was performed by John in Elephant's Memory, and for one thing, uh, Jeff Slate, who did most of the lead vocals. They did Woman is the Nigger of the World. And mm. I defy you to name any other band, a tribute band, that will actually take the time and do that song live. But uh, And Jeff Slate's vocals were, were fantastic on a song like that. He also did Mother, back-to-back, back, I think. Mm. And, you know, those are two real tough songs to sing. And the band was really just solid with uh, the Elephant's Memory guys. And, and Adam Ippolito uh, sang Imagine. And uh, Gary Van Syok sang, sang uh, Hound Dog. So they did most of the songs that were done at One to One, and that was a definite highlight for me. And the other thing I wanted to say was about Denny Lane, because he's also pushing, he's been working on a new album. And um, for Record Store Day, which we just mentioned, he's supposed to have a new single out with uh, two new songs, which I uh, previewed on my, my live broadcast of Every Little Thing a song called Meant to Be and Over the Horizon, and they both sound really good. Yeah. So if uh, Record Store Day comes, look out for that single. Yep. Denny's okay. also touring this year, um, doing uh, city wineries and places like that. Um, yeah. He just did one. He did New York uh, at the end of January and is actually coming back, I want to say, maybe in May, um, a 40th yeah, actually, anniversary yeah. of a uh, 45th. What is he doing? 40th anniversary of Wings Over America, the album Wings Over America. Right, he's been he's been doing those he's been doing those for a couple of years now. I mean, doing those kind of album tribute things. Um, no, he's doing he's doing the entire Band on the Run album, which he's been doing for a few years now. And he told me that for the first time, he's going to be doing the entire first Moody Blues album with that. Mm. Wow! So I didn't hear about Wings Over America though. No, it's it, the the. the Set list centers around doing the entire Band on the Run album, but the the marketing or the you know if you go to the the city winery homepage, uh, the the celebration or the tour is in honor of the fortieth. Uh, okay. Of Wings over America. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know he's also playing at Daryl's house. Mm. And that's oh, is he? Okay. Yeah, where I, where I saw him a few months ago. And um, yeah. I'll be giving away tickets for that on my website too. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, nice. And and before we before we get away from Saturday, since uh, Ken was only able to be there the one day, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, in the the discussion room, aka the act naturally stage. Uh, <laughs> Mm. We we tried to do a few different things this year, and uh, so on Saturday, in fact, uh, Ken uh, participated in a Beatles radio forum right. that we that we did with uh, Darren DeVivo of WFUV in New York and Lou Simon of uh, Sirius XM Radio and uh, Ken's old cohort uh, uh, Rob Leonard. 
of uh, right. Beatles songs and Fab Four uh, Free For All. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then that evening, he, uh, Ken and Kid O'Toole did a, um, uh, did a, a discussion of uh, buried treasures from the solo years. Well, we and, talked mainly about what we thought were the most um, underrated of the solo Beatle albums, picking one mm-hmm. for each. Right. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that was a and, lot of fun. And then just a couple of hours later, uh, Ken and Darren uh, did uh, an interview with uh, Gary Van Syck and, uh, and Adam Epolito, uh, which actually we've done before, uh, mm-hmm. which uh, uh, last year uh, at the New York Fest. But, uh, but still, it was, you know, it was a, some interesting, different little wrinkles there. Mm-hmm. And I must say, because I, I don't think I ever met Lou Simon before, but what a great speaker. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. He has a lot of insight. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's my, my very best friend in the world you're talking about there. Yeah. You guys are number two, me. three, four. You're number two, three, and four. But uh. he's my very best friend in the world you're talking about. Okay. But yeah, the one thing about Lou, because we were talking about our beginnings in radio, what led us to radio, and how uh, we first got into the Beatles, Lou said something which, you know, I, we know this information all these years, but you don't really think about it. He was talking about the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and how the Beatles broke so many rules. And mm-hmm. uh, first of all, not only did they do five songs in that first show, which is unheard of, most musical acts do one or two songs, but they actually opened with a song which wasn't their single. No. <laughs> you know, and first... I never really thought about that. So. Yeah, the first two songs, in fact, right. were yeah. both were album tracks. I mean, that's unheard of. Mm-hmm. Let's get on to Sunday. Um, uh, uh, Tom, you want to you want to give us a a little talk about Sunday? Sure. Um, well, the the early the early uh, stage uh, presentations. Chuck Gunderson did his always informative um, you know AV presentation on the Beatle tours. I mean, I've seen him do it a few times. It, it's just it's mm-hmm. fascinating. Every phenomenal. Time I mean, yeah. That, I mean, it's like the book. The, it's like the book. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Yeah. No, it's. it's yeah. It's a delight, and then uh, Denny uh, Denny Sywell did his Ram uh, demonstration where he plays along to the backing tracks and vocal tracks of the Ram album as a as a drum demonstration, mm-hmm. and then we had uh, a guest who was only there Sunday, uh, who I had the pleasure to host, Mr. Leon Wilds. Ah, time. you did you did Leon? Oh, good. The first a uh, first time. Uh, and I think the only man ever to sport a tie on the Beatle Fest stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he, he is just a wonderful, wonderful guy. He is. And uh, he was there with his son, Michael, who's his law partner and uh, who wrote the foreword for the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were prepared not only for, you know, to talk about this book, but, you know, I, I was talking to them before we went on and said, look, you know, here's how we'll do it. I'll, introduce him and you know we'll talk about the book and then he can take over and we'll save a few minutes at the end for questions and such and they said you know make sure when you introduce us and talk about the firm that you know that we're obviously still a you know a you know a a fully functioning immigration firm Mm -hmm. uh not that they needed the you know the shill or the plug or anything they said make sure you let them know that yoko is still a close friend and a client and one of our you know we have many many clients including Mrs. Trump, Melania Trump. And one of the things I had even told you, Al, going mm-hmm. in, is I said, you know, I hope when we get to the questions and answers, there's no one in the crowd that derails what yeah. should be a very good and informative John Lennon, you know, lecture with, mm-hmm. you know, with the politic of the day. Yeah. Uh, it's just not the place for it. Uh, he, told, he told me that he, he actually he, he represented Donald Trump, too. So yeah. uh, well, you said Melania, but it's actually he's done. Well, she's she's an immigrant, so uh, you know he he made me make that point. Um, uh, he did the so, immigra- hey, he like, did the immigration thing with Melania. Is that what it was? Yeah. So okay. yeah, I, I I put that in, and all it proved is that they were way smarter than me, and what and got ahead of it. Mm-hmm. Um, because after a few, you know, after one a very informative session and a couple of good personal stories. You know, we went to the crowd, and people were asking questions that were, for lack of a better term, on point. They were they were about John and about the case and about Yoko and about, you know, about that time. And we had time for one more question, and here it came. What do you think of President Trump's, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and they, 
by by getting in front of that thing with Melania Trump, they said, well, you know, while we might not agree with her politic, you know, and they they basically put some voice of reason to it, saying, remember, the president doesn't make the laws; the Congress does. Um, you know, the president can you know issue the executive orders to you know, to enforce or to escalate things like that, and you know. Right now is not the time or place to go into all that either. But mm -hmm. basically, they he was an 86-year-old man basically saying, I got this, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, and, and it, it, it did not let the, you know, an otherwise really good mood in the room uh, deteriorate. It didn't let it escalate. It was, of course, I mean, you know, to say the guy is lucid and, and you know, on point is an understatement. Yeah. Uh, but he basically said, you know, you know, at the end, like, does that clear it up for you? you yeah. Know? He and also was, he he also was on with Lawrence O'Donnell. I think it was last year, and he said he said that President Obama's immigration policies were actually uh, related to what he did with John. So uh, well, yeah, uh, yeah. Did he talk about did he talk about that? Did he talk about he that? did say that you know some of the some of the precedent that was set in the case mm -hmm. um you know uh, about you know accessing freedom of information records to you know to counter ultimately counter sue or file a counter claim and basically challenge the government to say if this is what you're throwing down how come it didn't happen to these other i think it was 2300 people mm -hmm. um there, there was they set the tone as they did in the book for anyone that's read it and it is a highly recommended book they set the tone up front, you know, without getting into any legalese. Anyone can understand these two words: selective prosecution. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they, it, and they were going after him, and that—that that was it. Right. It's an excellent uh, book. I've 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 read the book too, and uh, yeah, it was, it, it was it, a wonderful book. Yeah, it and, it explains. It, it's really. I mean, it's the go-to book to explain that case. I mean, other people have written about those times. But he's the man. No, I mean, no. This is the view from the captain's chair. Right. Let's face it. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Um, speaking, no, of, that, speaking, that was... of, speaking of politics, uh, and I don't mean to change the subject, but did anybody see the reaction to Denny Sywell's photo taken in front of Trump Tower? And I'm trying to remember what the cap what the sign he had, but it was not a pro-Trump sign. And mm. I posted it on my page, and I also posted it in my Beetle News and Commentary. And there were some people who were not real pleased about seeing that photo. That uh, mm. And cause they said, what's the Beetle no. reaction to this? And I said, Denny Sywell is a Wings drummer. Um, mm. But, you know, but I mean, uh, I'm just bringing this up. Just I noticed the picture is gone now, and I don't know if he'd pull the picture off offline or what. Um, but... Uh, that was a, kind of an interesting yeah. thing. Go ahead, uh, Ken. It, it's a problem whenever any celebrity of any kind says something political. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, some of their fans are going to be against it, regardless of what side you're on. Right. Because yeah. they, they take the attitude of, you know, you're a musician, you're a celebrity. You're not a politician. Why are you saying anything political? Well, and, you know, I know in the case of you know, Lawrence Juber has posted a lot of stuff mm -hmm. and, and his wife, Hope, and they get a lot of backlash on that. And you know Jack Douglas. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, I've <laughs> seen. I've, said, I've, yeah. I, yeah, I've seen Jack. Uh, Jack Douglas Daily mm. says some very. I mean, is very anti-Trump. As is Howard Kalin. I mean, there's a lot of people that right. are a lot of musicians that are very anti-Trump, and you know, and some people, some people don't like that, especially people that are that are pro-Trump don't like that. Um, so let, let's get off that. I don't want to... I don't want to... Good idea. I don't want to uh, turn this show into a political... I just wanted to mention that that had happened since we yeah. talked well, we talk well, about as a, as a, as a matter of yeah. fact, changing changing the subject Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I uh, didn't want to get out of Sunday without mentioning that, as I said, we you know we tried to do some, uh, some different things this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few years back... <laughs> Our old friend Martin Lewis, Martin Lewis, who um, in the uh, the Sound of Light contest would always say, "What, Tom?" Al Sussman of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Opportunity knocks. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. He would always, say, or actually, Beetle Opportunity knocks. Beetle Opportunity knocks. Okay. Yes, that's okay. But any Anyway, several several years ago, uh, Martin came up with the idea of having a press conference with the Ruddles. 
or in this case, three quarters of the Ruddles, right? Because Eric Idle wasn't there, but uh, Neil Ennis and Ricky Fatar and John Halsey uh, were all there, mm-hmm. and they had uh, you know various kind of uh, media, including me from Ruddle Fan Magazine, <laughs> and, <laughs> and we did a press conference. So, uh, so in earlier this year, in trying to kind of get some different uh, different angles for the discussion room, I thought, why don't we have a Q and A with the weaklings? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I brought it up to uh, to Marty Scott, who handles them for uh, for Gem Records, mm-hmm. and um, he thought it was a great idea. In fact, originally we had thought of doing a press conference, but. But they didn't. Marty said they really didn't have anything to really publicize, so we just made it a Q and A, and and so we we did that in the uh, in the discussion room. The the room was packed, mm-hmm. and uh, and the weaklings came in dressed up in the the same suits that they have on on the the cover of the uh, the new album, mm-hmm. and uh, I uh, uh, was able to uh, to get away from my normal habit of asking all the questions <laughs> and uh, after like just a couple of introductory questions opened it up to the uh, uh, to the crowd and it was uh, and we uh, we ended up uh, going for about an hour it was very very successful and then about an hour and a half later uh, they appeared on the main stage in the uh, in the ballroom in concert hmm Wow. That was also on Sunday afternoon, and uh, and it went over very very well. Let me let me just throw in something. Uh, Glenn, if Glenn Burtnick is listening out there, Glenn, you guys got to put out a live album. That's all there is to it. Because every yeah. time, everything I've heard sounds absolutely fantastic, and, yeah. and so I really I really hope that's in the cards someday. Um, well, they were talking about it. They were talking about it when they played at Daryl's house. Oh, were mm-hmm. they? They, they yeah. love they love the acoustics there. Especially. Well, I mean, so. just in general, their live sound. I wasn't thinking about specifically at Daryl's house, but their live sound is just so good. They just sound so good as a live band. And they're very and, tight. They're very right. tight. And it would yeah. be great to have that uh, have that on on CD or mm. on DVD for that matter. Oh, I oh yeah. How would you feel about a cassette? Because their their latest promo piece yes, is a cassette that's right. yeah. with three bonus songs on it. Right, right. From, the, from the album, from the album, from the second album. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, second I know, album. The second no, album. I know, I know about that. I mean, no, I'm talking about a a full album with you know a full live album, a live concert. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Hold on. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Tom is. Gonna... I think he's. Uh, I think he's. I think he may be uh, retrieving the uh, the cassette. Yeah. Yeah. Call it Exhibit A. This is you the have most it? recent addition to my cassette collection. Um, oh yes, the Weaklings. Uh, this is their second album, right? And on cassette, it comes with yep. three bonus cuts, uh-huh. which are it won't be long. All I've got to do, and I'm down. Three, we'll call them garden variety Beatles songs. Uh, anyone familiar with the Weaklings knows uh, their dip into the Beatle catalog is not the garden variety songs. It's the no. of, of the it's love, true. yeah. Because I know you love me so and things like that. But there it is, right there. Yes. Yes, right. He's showing it, it for, for our listeners. Uh, he's showing it on his on his Skype uh, camera, which none of right. you can see. Right. <laughs> mm. Put it on the website. No, 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 no. But anyway, but yeah, it's available. I, I believe that's available through the Weeklings website. Mm. Anyway. Yes, that, is, yeah, that it is. Yeah, I, I also I also do too. I just wanted to ask Tom one question. Mm-hmm. Because uh, on on Saturday I got to see the the last, the last half hour of the trivia mm. uh, contest, and I was really impressed with how much the contestants knew there, and they're all fairly young. But what I was really surprised at most of all was how many questions you asked that pertain to the American Beatles albums. Yeah, you know I I would think that anyone that's young now getting into the Beatles would be used to the British albums as they came out on CD. And yet, I was wondering if you could explain to me why you mixed you know, quite a lot. At least you, you were yeah. talking about introducing the Beatles on VJ. That's I correct. wouldn't expect anybody young, really, to know that kind of history. The, what um, I've done is, over the years, I try and write more and more questions, and I've somehow put them miraculously into chapters of, you know, 
like kind topics. So we have a whole chapter of questions on the Christmas album. We have a whole chapter of questions that are song lyrics. And those are always good because you can do it two ways. You can either give the lyric and say, what song is this from? Or give the song and say, tell me the opening line of this song. Uh, they cut both ways. So you gotta, you got to have enough for the casual fans versus the hardcores. And those American album questions that you're referring to, Ken, all came from a chapter that uh, it was called The British Are Coming. And it was about right. the Beatles invasion. Uh, so it was about Meet the Beatles. And it was about the Ed Sullivan Show. And it was about Washington, D.C. And then it was about that. The, the string of questions was something along the lines of what was the name of the third Beatle album released in America? Well, that, right. of course, the Beatles' second album. Um, what was the, you know, what was, in what year did Beatles 65 come out? Well, that'd be 64. Uh, things like that. Uh, just to, you know, to kind of keep them a little humorous, a little fresh. So that was fun. It was kind of interesting. Somebody, uh, one of the contestants, sent me a link this week to his YouTube page uh, where apparently he had to show the whole world that he was in the trivia contest. And, of course, now I have to write all new questions for next year because all the good questions are sitting out there uh, for the public to, to go learn. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, and this is, again, Al, make me get a Facebook page. Make me get a Twitter. Yeah. Make me get a YouTube page. Right, people, as, 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 I, as I keep saying, you're, yeah. you, you, you show great wisdom yeah. in staying well, away from social the, the media. Guy was, the guy was nice enough, like in the heading of the YouTube thing, to say, you know, and here's you know, my third video of the weekend. Uh, you know, he showed whatever, Klaus Vormann or the band or whatever. And he says, and, you know, the trivia contest, always fun, always a highlight of the weekend. I'm eating this up, right? Impeccably hosted by Tom Frangione, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just eating this up, right? <laughs> And then, of course, the trolls start weighing in. Yeah. And, you know, it got to a point where, like, again, one of the chapters is, it's called Number One. And it's all about, the answer to every one of these questions is a number one record. Right. Okay? It, it, by definition, the, the most popular songs that they ever released. Okay, so and it evolves around the one album. You know, which, I don't know, which two songs from the one album came from Revolver. Stuff like that. Okay? It's all about number one records and mm -hmm. the one album people are well what's with all the number one questions it's like okay a shut up okay <laughs> okay I, I, it's not my position to tell them by the way we had to get out of there in a hurry because we got a half hour late start you know why because something way more interesting than me asking trivia questions uh ran long yeah. at, at drummer's symposium right. and guess what you know, one, you know, when you know you have to make things move along faster, you go with not the hardest questions you have. Mm -hmm. um, right. You don't have to make them, you know, like kid proof, like, you know, what color is the cover of the white album, stuff mm -hmm. like that. But, you know, you, you want things that people will answer. And by the way, it was a really big crowd Saturday, not just at the, yes. party, at the trivia contest. And mm -hmm. you know what? Me stumping a whole room full of people with questions, that's not good entertainment, okay? Having them compete and, and make it interesting is what makes it fun. And by the way, uh, we had a, our own little slice of Beatle Fest history. Yes, on Friday the way, night. The way the contest runs, for any of you that haven't been there, is we pick four contestants and five points or five right answers wins the game. Mm -hmm. We play four rounds. And then the four winners come back for a, you know, a playoff or a final to come to a grand prize. Right. We had gotten to the finals and got to a four-way tie of four, of four right answers each. It came yeah. down to a winner-take-all question. Mm -hmm. okay? Anyone, it was anyone's game to win on one question. And that, that's what made it fast-paced. That's what made it fun. But mm -hmm. uh, as Ken can tell you, we had even more fun with it, uh, invoking yeah. more Honeymooners trivia, uh, you know, and setting things up. Oh, right. yes. So we had, uh, we had a lot of fun with it. It was, it was a good time. We had, a, you know, we had a, a crowd of enthusiastic people that were cheering on, you know, <laughs> contestants. And that's, that's what it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be me saying, look what I read that you might not have. Yeah. yeah. That, that's, exactly. not, that's not the yeah. purpose of the thing. The, uh, the I looked while we were while you were talking. I looked up those uh, those uh, those uh, YouTube videos, and they have uh, one of them has over two thousand videos or views in a week. 
So uh, that's uh, not too bad. Uh, you know, they've gotten, they've yeah, gotten except now I've got to write all new questions for next year. I think we're yeah. going to put this guy up here and say, make sure you run camera on this. Because what I want to do is send this out to you, you know, to your viewership and say, here's why we don't play Let's Watch Tom Stump the Whole Room. Mm-hmm. Because right. people will be walking out, and then it's, and it's no fun. Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to invoke the, the old Martin Lewis uh, yeah. rule about uh, no recording of... Uh, oh, no, yeah, I, I don't mind people recording it, but you know what? Don't put the whole freaking thing. You know? Yeah. 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 So that, there goes my whole question. I had, like, we went through the whole chapter of whatever number one questions. Well, I'm not going to be able to use those for a few more years till people forget them. Uh, <laughs> right, right. You're not going to tell me that you recycle old questions. Of course we do. <laughs> uh, one Steve there is supposed to be new and fresh. Well, but, well actually, but. there is there is one chapter that is always new and fresh. It's called current events. It's all yes. stuff that happened since the last fest. Okay, so you know what you know which Beatle project won a Grammy last month. Okay. That's you know it's a fair question. Okay, um, stuff like that. Okay. So we do, but, we do refresh them. Okay, but with the uh, the one questions. Was the question of questions in that video? It was, and uh, and and that kind of that's why I get upset when people do this. Okay, yeah. and we we won't blast it out to your thousands right. of listeners because now the question will have no cachet whatsoever, <laughs> and I'll win, I will win far fewer drinks at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, all right. I guess if you want to hear the question to questions, you'll. Have to go to Beetlefest to hear it, or yeah, I guess you will. <laughs> yeah. Come, okay. come to, come to Chicago. Come to Chicago. Yeah. There you go. In the middle of, uh, Won't the middle you of August. Won't come to Chicago? Uh, yeah. Yep, my kind of town. Whatever. Uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> gentlemen, I think we've run up uh, to the uh, to the barrier of the uh, of time. Uh, I think we've run out of time. Uh, uh, thank you very much for for uh, taking the time and. Uh, Anybody want to say anything? One one last thing before we before we kick it off and depart. Uh, one thing about Lawrence Juber. Yes. Mm. As we've talked about, he has a brand new CD out called "LJ Can't Stop Playing the Beatles." It's his third CD of Beatle covers, and on my website um, this coming Friday, which is the seventeenth of March, I'm doing a special contest where I'm giving away three copies of the CD signed by Lawrence. And one grand prize winner will also win his recent book, Guitar with Wings, which Ooh, came that's out. A beauty. Wow. Yeah, that's so, a beauty. Mm-hmm. But a lot of never before seen photos of Paul and the band during Lawrence's time, the last lineup of Wings. So that's on my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. And as always, visit uh, the website for weekly Beatles trivia. Funny and, how uh, you managed to sneak that in there, Ken. Yeah, really. Jeez. That was, uh, that, that was, was well, pretty damn he was, that was, he was at that the was fest. Slick. He was at the fest. Come on. You <laughs> tie it together. It's a perfect set. Okay. Anyway, um I will say the C D is wonderful. It really is. It is. Um so um even if you don't enter the contest it's a it's a beautiful C D. It really is. Al, do you want to say anything before we kick off uh for the night. Oh, uh, uh, just as a, you know, as Tom was saying before, I, I think it was a uh, a very very enjoyable fest, and uh, um, I, I, the, I guess probably the only <coughs> little possible negative might be that the um, the the ballroom mm-hmm. uh, at the uh, at the the Hyatt Regency Jersey City is a little bit on the small side, and mm-hmm. so it was really packed. It was jam packed for the concert on uh, certainly the concert on on Saturday night. Okay. Yep. Um, so that would be the, the you know the only little small problem, but uh, but otherwise it, it was an absolute. It's a wonderful venue, and so I'm really hoping that uh, that. Uh, that Mark will uh, will bring the fest back there uh, you, next you year. Get, you didn't get an indication that that was the case. I mean, I would think after the problems with the uh, with the the previous venue that they're going to stay there. I mean, I heard a lot of good things about that place. So I would. Yeah, I mean, I I would hope so, but of course, there's no there's no there's no guarantees. And as a matter of fact, all of the people. The people that keep whining about, oh, why don't you go back to the to the Secaucus Hotel? Oh, Guess please. what? The Secaucus Hotel no longer exists. <laughs> it is not only was the 
not only was the ex- exposition area where the flea market used to be torn down, the hotel's closed now. <laughs> So, it has ceased to be. Yeah, it has ceased you to know, be. this is a p- okay. courtesy of, of uh, Beth and Steve Shorten, who oh. took a bunch of photos there and posted them uh, uh, over the weekend. Mm. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, <laughs> hey, time marches on. Time marches on. Yeah, those things happen, right. folks. One last get- thing, I just want to say thanks to everyone who came up to me and probably Al to talk about things we said today, and and we we got a lot yes. of fans. Who came yeah. up to us so much? They really liked the show as well yeah. as my other show, Every Little Thing, and mm-hmm. it was great. It was, thanks fact, to all of you. Can I? In, can fact, I... On, on, in fact, on Thursday, uh, shortly after I got there, uh, a fellow named uh, Mike Narr uh, uh-huh. st- uh, stopped me in the uh, in the hall, and uh, you know I recognized his name immediately. Yeah, as a, I know uh, Mike. I saw Mike's know, name and, uh, several yeah. times online. Yeah, yeah, and stopped to say hello. Hi, Mike. Joe Gore- <laughs> <laughs> and Joe and Joe Gorman and right. uh, and uh, and a bunch of other people uh, who you know you you know only know by names, right? But it's, so it's nice. I to know put it's, a, it's fun when that face to, to them. That happened right. in that happened in Vegas too. Uh, a couple of people that that knew my knew me uh, uh, that I had talked to came up and introduced themselves, and it was like, wow, oh, this is really cool. So we are out of time, and I, I would love this discussion to go on for. Hours and hours and hours, um, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the meanie and, and cut it off and say, if you want to get a hold of us, you can write to the show at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We have a Facebook page, things we said today Beatles radio fans. We have uh, a Twitter account, things we said fab. Each of us has uh, uh, Facebook pages. We have email addresses. Uh, um, I'll give out mine real quick. It's BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. Al, your turn. Uh, you can get in touch with me real real quick and uh, real easy. Facebook, Al Sussman. Twitter, at ASUSS49 or through BeetleFan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. And I'll give Alan's uh, contact uh, info as well on Facebook. He's uh, Alan Cozen or his alter ego, Alan Cozen That's Remixed. Indeed. And, uh, and also, and also through the uh, through the show page, and uh, and he and Alan also has a Twitter presence. I believe he's just called it's just Coz at Coz. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, okay. I, and, be- I believe that's it. okay. And uh, Ken, your email address? Every little thing at att dot net. I want to thank our guest Tom Frangione and thank all of you for taking the time to listen and. For Ken Michaels, Al Sussman, and Tom Frangione, this is Steve Marinucci saying we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.